Welcome to Learning Functional JavaScript Section 3, Functional Asynchrony. In this section, we will tackle asynchronous programming and see how passing functions as arguments, so-called callbacks, play a major role. Finally, we'll review promises as a true functional approach to asynchronous programming. This is video 3.1, Callbacks. In the previous section, we learned about passing functions to other functions as well as returning them. In this video, we will expand on this technique by assigning functions passed as arguments the name callback. We will look at some examples from the Node.js based web server that allows people to play the adventure game. In the previous section, we saw a bunch of callbacks. For instance, consider this example from applying the change set to the user. The filtering function is often referred to as a callback. It's a function that filter will use to call back to us to decide whether or not individual items get to be part of the new collection. It's just a name. Another area where callbacks feature prominently is in asynchronous programming, the topic of this section. For instance, consider this HTTP request made through jQuery's Ajax function. In this case, the callback is provided via the success property of the object passed as an argument. We'll now turn our focus to the adventure game web server. The web server is implemented with Node.js, a server-side JavaScript runtime. Node provides a single-threaded runtime with an event loop. To avoid blocking the CPU when waiting for I.O., all I.O. should happen asynchronously. Node provides a full-featured I.O. library that is fully asynchronous. It uses the following basic pattern. That is, the last argument to the function is a callback. The callback will be called when the asynchronous operation completes. If it failed, the callback will be called with an error object and no result. Otherwise, it will be called with a result and no error object. The Adventure Game web server handles users and their gaming sessions, persisting everything to a database. The first thing you have to do when you want to play is to sign up. When you post your email and desired password, the web server will encrypt the password and store the hash. This way, no one can ever see your password, even if the database is hacked. The user controller has a save function responsible for saving new users. To encrypt the password, we will use the bcrypt package, which can be installed through npm. Step 1 is generating a salt. The callback follows the default node style. If generating the salt fails, we need to abort by calling our callback with the error and returning. When we have a salt, we can use it to create the password hash, which is yet another asynchronous operation. Again, we must abort if creating the hash fails. When we have the hash, we can build the final user object and store it in the database using the user's username as a key. Note that prior to calling the save function, the controller has validated the user and made sure that the username was unique. Storing the user could possibly fail as well, so we dance the same dance as before. Finally, we can call the callback passed to the save function. Again, we manually construct a user object. We only want to expose the username and the list of games. The salt and the password hash are strictly used for verifying the password at login. There's a few things to note in this example. First of all, we keep nesting one level deeper for every step. All these tasks are asynchronous, but each step depends on data from the previous step, so they must execute in sequence. Callback-based asynchronous APIs called in sequence generally result in arrow-shaped code like this. We could mitigate it to some degree by extracting callbacks as named functions, but that would make it harder to grasp the overall flow. There's also a lot of explicit error management here. I wouldn't really call it error handling because we're not really handling any errors, we're just passing them along. This is another weakness in this style of programming. Perhaps the most important point to take home from this example is that while there certainly are many functions involved, this example does not constitute a good example of functional programming. In functional programming, the goal is to model data relationships, transforms, and dependencies. Looking at this piece of code, it really does none of those things. Instead, it states exactly what to do, when to do it, 
and how to do it. And that is the hallmark of imperative programming. In the next video, we will look into the ways of streamlining this sort of code into processes that include less mechanics.